Welcome to my channel, I'm Dr. Romano. Have you ever wondered what would happen to the US dollar if we did have a cryptocurrency that was pegged to maybe gold or some commodity or possibly the US dollar? Before we continue the video, please remember to subscribe if you like my channel and please also, if you watch the video, do thumbs up. It really does help me because it gets the video out to other people so they can also help themselves. Well, a little story about the US dollar. In 1945, we had a, a situation where it changed the world order. The pound was no longer pegged uh, as the reserve currency, it was the US dollar that became the reserve currency. Now, in that case, was it good for America? It was not. Because since 1945, that's what, 75, 70 something years, we've seen manufacturing leave the country continually. And the past 20 years, that was evident that we were eventually not gonna have any manufacturing. And it was gonna be very hard for anyone to compete in the US markets if they made their products here. That had a lot to do with the US dollar becoming stronger in other countries. So in other words, it became too expensive for US manufacturing to make their goods here. And in order for them to stay afloat, they actually had to go overseas. And that started in the 1970s during the Richard Nixon era. He's the one that created that first trade agreement. Then of course, during Bill Clinton era, he was the one that could have fixed that because it came to a point where, um, you know, the mid 1990s, it was, it, Manhattan was kind of getting better, but it was still dirty. Uh, not as bad as the 1970s. However, that was all created because our factories were leaving America. And Manhattan used to be an enormous place that pretty much a lot of those buildings were manufacturing. For example, in NoHo, Manhattan. NoHo was where they used to make the tools. Those loft buildings were tool, tool companies. The garment district by Macy's, that's where they made garments. And, and so on. I'm not gonna tell you the whole, you know, where everything was made, but after the competition was opened up for foreign products to come into the country, it put out literally thousands, millions of people out of work. And that's what you've seen in Manhattan in the 1970s and early 80s, how dirty it became. Secondly, yes, people were moving out of the city. They wanted to have a house and it was cheaper to live outside the city. Uh, but the outcome was is that there were no jobs and we have to question out why that actually happened. So that happened because the US dollar was now becoming the world's reserve currency in the 1940s. It took a number of decades to really affect US manufacturing and US jobs. During Bill Clinton, he had the opportunity to fix it by putting up tariffs or he created a real estate boom and bust type of market that a lot of people would be supplying either uh, services to that industry or they would be selling goods. You would have the real estate brokers making money, the builders, uh, people buying and selling houses and flipping them. That whole, and of course the, the uh, home goods sector was booming ever since then. And the home sector is like your furniture, your everything that you put into a house. There was a, enormous uh, repercussions because of that agreement that he did. And what it was, it was to make everyone own their own house. I don't know what it was called exactly, but he basically made it a lot easier for everyone to get a mortgage. And he did that too with student uh, loans. I remember um, how hard it was, but the cost of education was actually really cheap because you could get a bartending job and pay for your tuition at five, 6,000 a year or 7,000. Now my school went from 7,000 when I went there to today it's, it's past 60,000 with room and board. That's not sustainable. So in other words, someone's gonna study literature, spend $60,000 a year on school and then get out and make zero. 
Exactly. So it's not even worth it to go to college anymore unless you become an attorney, unless you become a medical doctor or something that actually does really make money. Because if you're going to spend all that money and have a $200,000 debt the day you graduate college, well, you're already become even poorer because you have to buy a car, you have to buy a house. And so that means that your, your wealth is going to be diminished because you already have a debt, such a huge debt. The dollar became the reserve currency. And what does that actually mean? Okay. It's not just about oil. Okay. It's about people in other countries. They actually exchange goods and services with the U S dollar. Okay. Because their, their currency is not stable. All right. The U S dollar is a very stable currency because of our government and the fact that we have the ability to protect ourselves as a country, meaning the atomic bomb. Okay. That's what, that's how the U S dollar became the reserve currency because we were the leaders at that point in order for cryptocurrency a particular cryptocurrency in order for it to become the world's reserved currency, let's say it has to be stable. It can't be fluctuating up and down like Bitcoin or any of those other cryptocurrencies. And that's what the issue is. And so the older people, they were never put their money in Bitcoin and say, Oh, you know, we're going to, it's going to protect ourselves. No, it's better to hold gold coins than cryptocurrency right now. But you know, when you have millions of dollars in gold coins, that's a lot of money. Uh, of course, yes, you could get gold bullion, but unfortunately you need to stay away from gold bullion because a government can confiscate that. They're not going to confiscate your gold coins. So with that in mind, cryptocurrency will never become the world's reserve currency unless somehow it becomes stable. And right now, as I'm speaking, that's the path. So whoever was in, what was it, uh, several um, years ago, they, they introduced Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin was the mother of all cryptocurrencies. And where did Bitcoin come from? Well, it came from our government. Not the actual name of it, not the product, but the concept. The federal government during the Cold War era needed some sort of payment exchanges, okay? For their military, their projects. And at the same time in the 70s and 80s, you also had the internet that was created. That was a government concept. And the people that worked on that project for the government, they later, once the government realized the Cold War was over, there was no need for it. And so maybe a decade, yeah, a decade later, when I was going to school, because I learned all this, I took computer programming, uh, it was now, it, it, so those people that understood it and the, what they were the ones that created in that group, they created the World Wide Web, which is the uh, internet, internet. And that's how it got started. So a lot of good things come from government uh, projects, believe it or not, and government funding. The government is very helpful. Uh, in a way, they, they it kind of goes you know, it's a balanced relationship. You have to have the government there to fund these projects and you have to have the, the civilians. With that in mind, once you had the internet created, you also had the um, a, a cryptocurrency concept that was created. The people that worked on that project, one of them or two of them, whoever it was, they improved it and then they, they basically launched it to the public as Bitcoin. So that was the first introduction to cryptocurrency. I already knew what the outcome was and already knew the direction back then. And so now that we've been seven years, eight years into cryptocurrency, we feel comfortable with it. We love trading it. We love uh, playing around with it, um, but it's lacking something. And so now they've introduced a cryptocurrency that's more stable, that it's pegged and that it will be pegged by something, even though that it's, it will be pegged by something, whether it's gold commodities, whether it's 
pegged by the Dow Jones, uh, whatever it's pegged by, that still fluctuates. And so people in other countries are not going to put all their money into this cryptocurrency and use it as a monetary value because it still fluctuates too much. Okay. That's why people don't do gold coins or, or I mean, the perfect investment are diamonds, believe it or not, but we won't get into that in that video because diamond prices never, never drop. They always go up or trade sideways. So when stock market collapses, diamond prices trade sideways. And when, and when the economy does good, diamond prices skyrocket and they continue that way because the diamond industry has control over those prices. The company De Beers and many other companies, not so many, but a few, are the ones that actually control the supply so if the demand goes up, they increase, um, you know, the supply. And if the, the demand goes down, they, they pull back. And so that's why diamonds are a better source of cryptocurrency. If you actually want to preserve your wealth, you just buy the diamond certificate. It's a, it's a size of a credit card. And inside that you have the plastic cover and you actually have a cut diamond and on the, um, it has a serial number that's been engraved, etc. So anyway, I'm not talking about diamonds in this video because I made a video on that. So you have to think about how, so why would someone need a cryptocurrency that's pegged by something, right? Well, it has to be stable. And so if eventually the concept does happen, which it's going to happen because something's happening with the dollar now, we have two countries that are threatening us. Let's say that they do not use dollars to buy oil or trade oil. Let's just say that. Well, the value of the dollar will go down. However, there's still millions of people trading uh, goods and services with the US dollar, let's say like in Brazil or, or Argentina or Central America or wherever, or in Africa, let's say, or even in Asia. Once the, the, the cryptocurrency becomes a sort of a equivalent of a dollar, of a hundred dollar bill. Okay. So they trade a hundred dollar bills. Um, and you know, that's, that's how it is. So when you are bartering, doing a bartering system, you're not going to use gold coins. You're using the dollar. And so cryptocurrency, yes, it's going to be taken over the, the concept of how other country, the people in other countries, um, buy goods and services with the dollar, or they stack it up and they put it under their bed or, you know, safe deposit box, wherever. In order for the cryptocurrency to take over that, uh, that the job of the, what the US dollar does, the currency has to be very stable. They will do it. It's coming. And so what will happen to the US dollar? It will drop in value. So in other words, we Americans will not, it will take more dollars to buy the same product. That's actually a good thing for us. And that's what we want. Whether or not this is a 30 year plan, a uh, 20 year plan with the boom and bust market for the past 20 years, two decades almost. Yeah, around two decades. Two, no, actually two and a half decades since, since Bill Clinton created it. We have now the change. So the U.S. housing market can't go up anymore. Unfortunately, the average person, uh, $700,000 for a house when you don't even make 100,000? No, sorry. If you are buying that, that $700,000 house and you even put down money, you got problems, honestly. That's not normal. If you make $100,000 a year, that means that your income is 2,000 per week after taxes, that should be your mortgage payment. Not two weeks income, not a week and a half, whatever it is, it's one week per month. And if you go past one week per month, your risk management approach is very volatile. It's very dangerous. And that's why people get married or have 
uh, you know, partners because there's two people on the mortgage and two people paying the mortgage payment. And that's how they qualified for the loan. That's bad because when you get a divorce, you have to split everything and there's nothing left because you have to pay, you know, taxes and everything else. So in order for this to happen, it is, how could you take advantage of it? It's simple. You need to become a manufacturer of goods, household products, not furniture, not expensive uh, products that people buy when they buy a new house. No, I'm talking about products that people use every day in their house, socks, uh, there's so many things you have to come up with the list. And so right now you should actually sell your real estate. Uh, if you think you're going to sell it and make money, cause this is the time to sell it before it actually starts dropping. And you should invest in a property like land in a small town that you could put a warehouse 20, 50 by a hundred prefabricated warehouse. This is steel structure. It's not millions of dollars it takes to actually build it. It's like not even 70,000, less than that, depending on where you live. And you want to get prepared, okay? Pay it off, work to pay it off, and then prepare yourself on what you're going to do to make a product because you will actually win. You have already prepared yourself. You've established your wealth by selling your real estate. And of course, I mean, if you're older and your mortgage is paid off, don't sell your house or your properties if it's paid off. It doesn't, it's, it's not worth it because you have to pay capital gains. But if you're someone like a mortgage broker that bought a couple houses because you were making money and you're relying on the rental income, you better sell those houses now. It's really bad because if you can't pay your mortgage for six months at a time and you don't have that kind of savings, what if you get sued? Then you have nothing and you have no reserve money to pay your mortgage when it's not rented. What if it's rented for two years? So basically that's what would happen and that's how you could align yourself to reduce your risk. That's risk management, um, asset protection. And of course, you could pretty much start to buy equipment now. So if I were you, I would think about maybe making tools, basic tools that are already out in the market. You don't need to come up with some new concept. No, you simply need to take the tool, improve it, make it better, stronger, and produce it. Or you can make anything that's really simple that doesn't require a lot of people. A lot of um, machinery reduces the staff needed to make the factory. So believe it or not, if you start now, you actually have an upper hand. I wanna thank you so much for watching. Please remember to subscribe to my video. If you like my video, do thumbs up. It would really help me. I really appreciate this since I do it for free. And please remember to share my video with at least five people. And finally, send me messages to the live chat. I wanna thank you so much for watching.